What is up, everybody? Thank you so much for tuning into another episode of Rocket Vlogs. Now, last year we answered the question that was taking the internet by storm Can JB Weld go the speed of sound? And quite frankly, to nobody's surprise, it can. JB Weld is, after all, the sixth wonder of the world. That flight went about Mach 1.3, which is right around 1,000 miles an hour and about 10,000 feet. Not a bad flight, not a bad show. It was pretty cool, but. I've decided that now it's time we step up this level of JB Weld testing. It's time to up the ante a bit. The last flight used an Aerotech i500, was a Blue Thunder 38mm i motor, and if you'll recall, I complained pretty profusely about having to make an electronics bay for a 38mm rocket. And I even said in that video that I vowed once that I would never do anything smaller than 54, so obviously the next step up is 54 and we're not taking it easy on the old JB Weld for a myriad of reasons but for one this is a K455 this is a K impulse rocket motor and it has a single grain of a really fast burning propellant and the rest of it is not a slow burning propellant it's Aerotech's white lightning which is one of my favorite propellants of all time but it is still going to be pretty spicy and uh, the whole point of having that boost sustain you can kind of see the thrust curve right there yeah yep big initial spike of thrust and then a long sustained burn. Simulations right now say this flight should go about 20,000 feet into about Mach 1.7, which is nothing to shrug at, but we're upping the ante even further because this is a single use motor, just like the last one we used. We slid it into a rocket, a minimum diameter build, right? No motor tube, motor just goes directly into the rocket. Well, we are taking that a step further too. This is a composite case rocket motor. This is, I believe, filament wound fiberglass. I don't think it's carbon fiber. But what that means is since we're using composite fins, we can make a nice strong bond directly to this motor case. And that is what we're going to do. So not only will JB Weld have to deal with the Mach 1.7 speed, the hefty acceleration, but it's also going to have to deal with the fact that this motor case gets very, very hot when it's burning. So while we didn't really test how great JB Weld is in high heat last time, we're definitely putting it to the test this time, which I think is great because that's kind of one of the biggest claims JB Weld likes to make, right? That it's a high heat welding epoxy. Anyway, I think that's about enough talking. We're just going to start building this thing and I'll walk you through it in voiceover mode as we go through the build. Not quite to voiceover mode yet, actually, because... Step one is a little bit interesting and I want to show it to you guys now. Remember with our Flying Santa project that I just uploaded, if you haven't watched that video, please go check it out. It was a lot of fun to make. Base Drag helped us out a lot in keeping that rocket stable. But Base Drag is not our friend on this build. It is our worst enemy and this thrust ring has to go. This is designed to go in a rocket with a 54 millimeter motor mount and this stops the motor from going up into the rocket. And that's exactly what I want to demonstrate here. If you are flying one of these rocket motors with the 3D printed rear thrust ring, that would namely be the Aerotech DMS motors, you want to ensure that the motor case is completely snug against your motor tube because there is a sort of hammering effect that can happen with a high power rocket motor if it's not seated all the way and it slides up like that when the motor starts. And obviously my arms are not as strong as this rocket motor, but you can see it doesn't take much to take it off. Of course, we're starting where we always do, sanding. With this build, to ensure we're getting the best composite bond we possibly can, we're taking a couple of extra careful steps here. First and foremost, we're sanding our bonding surfaces with 120 grit sandpaper in as many directions as we possibly can. This includes both the motor case and fins. If you're wondering, yes, it does feel super wrong to sand a loaded rocket motor. This sanding is going to give us an ideal composite bonding surface without causing any damage to the parts themselves. Many folks use extremely heavy grit sandpaper like 60 or 80 when prep sanding fiberglass, but you can actually do more harm than good with that method. I've linked an amazing rocketry forum thread about properly bonding composites that I highly encourage you to read if you're going to be building composite rockets. In the spirit of that thread, once we have sanded our surfaces, it's gloves on and a good thorough wipe down with isopropyl alcohol until the paper towels are coming off the components clean. From this point on, I'm making a point to do my best to avoid touching any of the bonding surfaces with bare hands or dirty gloves. Just like with the 38mm build, I 3D printed a set of fin guides to ensure these fins are on as straight as possible. 
With a fresh set of gloves, I use CA and quick set to tack one fin in place, and I know what you're thinking. That's not JB Weld, and you're correct. We're using a tiny dab of CA to keep this fin in place as an alignment guide. Once it's glued down, we use it and the fin jigs to properly adhere all three other fins at once with a healthy helping of JB Weld, which you can see me measuring out here with a scale. While it's true that you can just eyeball JB Weld or any 50-50 epoxy for that matter, I'm doing my best to keep the ratio exactly half and half to ensure proper curing for maximum strength and temperature resistance. Once those are on and we're sure there's no epoxy runoff touching our fin guides, we don't want those glued to the motor case, just the fins, we set the rocket down and allow the fins to cure overnight. Once the three other fins cured, I snapped the CA fin back off and took to meticulously resanding its spot and following the same alcohol cleaning procedure as before. Then we threw on fresh gloves and glued that fin on with JB Weld too. From there, I let that final fin cure for a full 24 hours to ensure all four fins were sufficiently bonded to the motor case for fillets. Then I took out some blue painters tape and masked off my fillets, which I'll be smoothing out with a plastic spoon. These fillets are quite large for a rocket this size, but it's important that our fillets on this rocket are serving both aerodynamic and structural purposes. We want to ensure that these fillets, above all else, are going to hold these fins tight to the motor case. Going nearly two times the speed of sound is no joke. After masking everything off, I mixed the biggest batch of JB Weld I've ever used in my entire life and carefully laid out the fillets and smoothed them over with our spoon. They didn't quite come out perfect, so I let them tack up for about three hours, then returned with a fresh clean glove. With some very light dips of my finger in alcohol and extremely light touches, I smoothed and molded the fillets into my desired shape. This is an awesome trick for finessing your fillets into what you want them to be, but you have to be careful not to wet out the epoxy with too much alcohol. You could drastically affect both the amount of time it takes to cure and its overall strength if you soak the epoxy with too much alcohol. After letting the fillets cure for 24 hours, it's time to address recovery. For the first step, I'm drilling a hole through both sides of the ejection charge well and running a bit of quarter inch Kevlar through both holes and tying it off. Then I tied about 15 feet of the same shock cord to our loop and bam, that's how the recovery gear is attached. Just to ensure everything stays put though, I filled the charge well with, you guessed it, JB Weld. Next up is addressing where all that recovery gear is going to go. First and foremost, I need to remove the nice label on the motor since it's exactly where I'm going to be gluing a bit of airframe. The plan here is to cut a piece of 54mm fiberglass tube to 8 inches and glue it to the motor case. I like to use a piece of printer paper as a straight edge wrapped around tubes to give me a nice line to follow while I'm cutting. Then, while it's tedious, you can use a fresh X-Acto blade to cut through fiberglass tubing. It took nearly 4 hours to do, but no, I'm just kidding, I cut it with an angle grinder. After sanding and cleaning both the inside of the tube and the motor case, I mix up the second biggest batch of JB Weld I've ever made in my life and lathered up the top two inches of the motor case, then slid the tube over with the swirl to ensure that epoxy gets in every last nook and cranny. Boy, that JB Weld batch was way too big for just that task, I wonder if we have something- oh yeah, fortunately Shane, or as you might know him, Postart, designed me a tail cone that slides over the nozzle of the K455. I 3D printed it from PETG, roughed up the inside, did a very light bit of sanding on the nozzle, and glued it in place. Overall, this was a bit of a messy install, so after letting the JB Weld tack up for a couple of hours, I once again used the alcohol trick to smooth the joints between the motor case and both the tail cone and our little bit of airframe. Just like that, we're smooth and aerodynamic, and have a standard sized tube that I can throw a simple electronics bay and nose cone onto. Would you look at that, Postart designed me a sled too. As is tradition around here, I made an extremely simple setup with a single 9 volt battery and a perfect flight Stratologger CF. This assembly is basically identical to how all of my electronics bays are and it uses standard head end dual deployment. I've covered both of these topics in previous videos, so I'll link to them in the description instead of dragging on about them right now, because I'm pretty sure you're about ready to see this thing fly, right? Well, good. After all the epoxy fully cured, I threw a lick of high temp barbecue paint on the fins and upper airframe components, drilled holes for shear pins, installed the electronics bay and ejection charges, packed a 30 inch parachute in the nose cone, and just like that, is ready to go. 
All right, folks, there it is. I've decided to dub this project Severance Package uh, for fairly obvious reasons. If you're not familiar, it's because I just lost my job, but fillets aren't real pretty, but you know, they don't need to be. It's only needs to work once, right? So my plan is to twist these and I'm gonna, once we have continuity confirmation, just tuck them in as far as I can with maybe like a quarter inch of the wire sticking out, fold it down, piece of tape over it. The tape's definitely gonna come off, but as long as most of the wire's in there, um, I think it should be okay. My only slight concern is that maybe the air could rip the wire out of the altimeter, but Taylor's flown this fast and faster with just twisted wires not even taped, so that's what I'm leaning on, and hopefully everything's just fine. Yeah, I don't if that doesn't convince you that the JB welds okay, I don't know what will, huh? Those are yeah, you're right. Just cut that down, throw a motor in there. Mm -hmm. Alright, you wanna film me trying to pull it out? Yeah. No it's like the sorcerer's stone. I don't know, it looked wobbly. Oh my gosh. Oh. Oh wait, your nose cone's still in there. No. See how good that knot is I tell Oh, good job. Look at that, huh? There's your tracker. Oh, I don't know if that's going to survive. Ooh. No, that's the all thread. The tracker's in here. Oh. Was. Oh. Dude. There's the tracker. <laughs> oh, that might be okay. Yeah. Oh. It looks a little crushed. Oh, no, it's not. Yeah, it's flat. That Kevlar is probably usable. Oh, parachute maybe. Wow. I'm amazed that you're able to just pull that go. out like that. <laughs> It looks like your charges went off. They did. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't... It didn't look like it had too much, like, horizontal velocity either. And the charges were, like, very large for the volume. What was holding the, the nose on? Two shear pins. Like all right, folks. Well, there it is. The 54 millimeter version of the JB Weld attempt. And honestly, if it suddenly hitting the ground, probably at several hundred miles an hour and not knocking these fins loose just from the sudden stop doesn't convince you that the JB Weld did just fine. I don't know what will. The rest of it, yeah, well. We got some work to do on ejection charges from high altitude recovery stuff, but, oh yeah, there's another K455 case here that I thought would be fun to put in the shot just so you can kind of see how long it used to be before Unfortunately, all this means is that we're going to have to try this again at some point, but I don't know how soon that's going to be. At any rate, I'd like to thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of Rocket Vlogs. I want to say thank you to my friend Chase for actually finding this thing buried in the ground. It's a, a fun shot, if nothing else, of the fin sticking out of the ground. This is actually the first time I've ever gotten a ballistic impact rocket back, so that's pretty new, but... Uh, Thank you so much for watching. I want to extend a special thank you to my Patreon supporters whose names are rolling across the screen right now. They knew about this project long before you saw it. So if you want to see some behind the scenes stuff and all the stuff that I'm working on in the background that I'm not talking about on YouTube just yet, check out patreon.com slash rocket vlogs or press the join button below because I post the behind the scenes stuff for channel members as well. If you want to rep some anti-gravity group or rocket vlogs merch, check out rocketvlogs.com. My name is Braden Carlson and we'll try again next time.